Good day and welcome to this week's episode of Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. I am your host, Rondell Don, or attorney at law. Once again, I'm happy to be alive. I'm happy to bring the law and you. Uh, today, we are going to speak about a very um, a trending topic, uh, land fraud. I mean, we have seen a lot of time, well, we have seen of recently in the media, um, there have been a lot of um, crackdown on the uh, on persons who are committing um, fraudulent activities with respect to um, the acquisition of land uh, or the appropriation of land, rather, um, both in the criminal um, jurisdiction as well as in the civil jurisdiction. We have seen persons um, just recently, there was a case um, whereby it was a family squabble, well, not a family squabble, but at least um, someone would have purchased lands that was already that had already belonged to someone else, and as a result, um, the, the loan justice um, would have pronounced on that particular um, case and referred the issue to a fraud squad. And today we are going to speak about basically what is um, the different types of um, land arrangements in our jurisdictions. Um, what do you look for in terms of when you're purchasing land um, and property, etc., and um, and what and, and how to avoid becoming a victim of uh, fraud, particularly in land. And today we have a special guest, Desiree Sanka, attorney at law. Uh, she practices in the area of civil litigation, family law, industrial law, probate, and conveyancing. And throughout her career, she has been involved in several matters at both the high court and appellant level, where she has acted as both advocate and instructing attorney. Uh, Desiree has a broad family law as well experience, as well as she is involved in land law. Uh, she is part of Fortis Chamber, uh, where the head of chamber is Mr. Jack Dio Singh. Uh, she is a proud product of the University of the West Indies, KFIL, and she obtained her LEC uh, from the Hewitting Law School. She has been in practice for approximately nine years. Uh, so today we have in studio Ms. Desiree Sanka. Good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you? And it's a pleasure to be here this morning. So it's a pleasure you. to thank have you. Thank you for having me. No problem. It's a pleasure to have you. And of course, you know, we, this is, a, as I said, a very controversial topic in terms of what is happening now. But of course, it's important to impart that knowledge um, to the viewers and listeners to understand how do we get to avoiding becoming a victim of, um, of, of this Of land product. fraud. Yes. Because <laughs> yes. honestly, people say it's something that's new, but this is something that has been happening for years. Yes. Right, it's not a it's not a new topic. Uh, it's just it's getting more of the limelight now. Indeed, and and then per, um, pe persons are beginning to act, right? Yes, um, persons are beginning to to uh, to either to uh, to make reports to the police, um, go through the civil courts in terms of in terms of um, getting some sort of redress. But let's go in terms of the basic. Now, what are the what are the types of um, land systems that are, that we have operating in Trinidad and Tobago? So essentially, we have two systems that operate in Trinidad, and they operate uh, simultaneously. So we have what we call the common law or the old law system, right? That is specifically to put simply that's considered deeds. Then you have the new one, which is the RPO, or some people call the RPA system. That deals with what you call a certificate of title. Now, a lot of people might be like, well, what is a certificate of title? Simply put, it's a big document that has a certificate of title written across it. It has the name of the owner, the description of the property. When you're dealing with common law, it's deeds. And with those deeds, that traces each transaction. So each transaction, you have to do a different deed for it. And in that, you have to do title searches and we get what we call a good route. Essentially, go back 20 years and you could only use a conveyance or a mortgage because had consideration, meaning money, has to have passed during the transaction. Now, some persons may ask, what's the difference between a deed and a, a certificate of title? Why do we have two separate um, types of, of land systems? So the vision was to create one system to document everything so everyone can trace all their titles in one document. That is what the certificate of title, what most of the time will say a CT, that does that. So at the front of it has the information concerning land. The back of the document has the endorsements. endorsements. Now, that means it will say, who owns the property, when it was registered, it will say what volume and folio that specific memorandum would be in. Any transaction as it pertains to that land has to be endorsed at the back of that certificate of title. You will have one original copy and the land registry will have the other. So say you engage in a transaction and I'm going to sell you some land that I have, I have to, after we do the memorandum, I then have to submit that original CT to the Registrar General for them to endorse that at the back of the document, you then get a certificate of title. So therefore, it's an easier choice in terms of when you are dealing trace. with um, yes. uh, whether it is, well, obviously, there's, there's, the search will be The search the will be at the back. 
it will be there, whether it's the, uh, the conveyance, a mortgage, a release of a mortgage, a deed of assent. Everything has to be endorsed at the back of the certificate of title. Now, how, someone, how will someone know in terms of purchaser um, if, I'm, if they are purchasing a, a, a land on the common law deed or under the RPA, which is, as, as you said, is the real property. Um, the real property yeah, acts, act, what they call right? it. Right. Um, how, how, how does someone, will, how will they know that, um, the difference? So this is where your search is coming. Now, if you're going to engage in a transaction, of course, the person will give you the title documents that they have. They may have a deed or they may have a certificate of title. People are not going to give you the original certificate of title, right? You'll get a copy, same thing, you'll get a certified copy of a deed. You now can get a search clerk to go and search your registry. There's this new system. So people would say, because you know, everybody would know now legal affairs moved, and you could get a search clerk, they go in and they search all the books and in the vaults and they get the different documents. But there's also an online system which just came into effect a few, well, a while ago, they were setting it up. Yes. Um, called when the PBR. They took, when they took away our, um, our free monies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the PBRS system. So the search clerk, as well as attorneys, once they're registered, have access to the system. It has both the RPA documents in it, as well as the common law documents. So once you have the name of the owner, you have the, um, the deed number, or the volume and folio number, a description, or a year, you can do your relevant searches and find the documents there. Because you have to be careful, because sometimes, well, an act of fraud, someone might look to do, is a, a document is under, or the land is under the RPO system, and say, well, I have a deed for this. But then you start searching and say, but this is this RPO, this, how are you giving me a deed? A it's deed, not, yes. It's, that's common, it's two different And of course, under systems. the RPO system, as I said, you must, in order to know that it is legitimate, it must be a certificate of title, which is yes. the big A3, I think. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. look for the big document, it's kind of like a yellow paper, and it says certificate of title at the top of it. So. Now, is it that, as you said, is it that there are certain areas in, in Trinidad and Tobago that has only RPO lands, meaning where you get certificate of title versus deed? Or? So it, it just it varies. But you can also do an application to have land brought from under the common law system under the RPO system. I mean, no, that's a, that's a, a long process. That's a process, yes, that is a process. Now, let's deal in terms of, um, of course, land fraud. And, right. and, and if you can just give us an overview of how land fraud is, is committed, uh, what, <laughs> what so, do people do? <laughs> so, essentially, there are two things you would look at. Fraudulent deed, or for lack of a better, an imposter, right? Now, before you can know what is a fraudulent deed, you have to know what a good deed looks like. Right? So certain things is, one, it has to be prepared by an attorney. Now, I just want to go through good elements first before certainly. we start to really get into it. So it has to be prepared by an attorney. It would have the stamp from the Board of Inland Revenue showing that stamp duty would have been paid on it. Now, the stamp, it has changed over the last couple of years. Before, it was like individual stamps on the documents. Yes, seen like different coins. Yes, yes, looks like little coins on it. And now it's like a big stamp that has stamp duty. It has how much stamp duty paid, if there was any penalties. Right? And that's a big stamp on the document. And the deed has to be registered. When it is registered, you will get a deed number. It will say certified copy, and each page of that document will be stamped. Now, that has changed a little bit now. Um, I think maybe last two or three months or so. Um, whereby now, when you get a certified copy of a deed, they have what we call the QR code, because right, the judiciary is trying to digitize a lot of things. So there's a QR code that will appear at the top of the document. There's also a cover sheet that's certified, that's certified by the Registrar General. It also bears the Registrar General stamp and signature, and it has your deed number. So even if you take your phone and you scan that QR code, the deed will turn up, right? So these are the little things you're going to look out for a good deed. If now, this is where it comes, there are, ex there are certain things I feel look out for. The attorney, look at the name of the attorney. The person may be like, okay, this is um, John Doe, and it may be spelled with an N, but then you realize, but how come the attorney left a letter missing the name? Something may as simple as that, right? Look at the vendor. The vendor could be, the signature could be off, the vendor could be presented a false ID. Same thing with the witness. And all these things could be forged. Now, with the imposter aspect yes. of it now, people just come up and say, I own that land there, you know. And you, so you're thinking, okay, you really own this property? You say, yeah. And they'll come and they will show you, they'll show your ID. And you say, okay, well, this, have to be, this has to be the person that owns the property. You or your attorney needs to verify the identification of that person. This is your actual, this is your due diligence that you're doing. And more so your attorney that does it. The attorney has to request two forms of ID. Preferably make sure identification card is one. 
You could be a DP as the second one, you could be a passporter, right? But have two forms of ID. They could also check, their, check against the elections on Boundary's website to, to verify the identity of the person mm -hmm. and they are living at the address that they say they live in at and whatnot, right? And as you said that, uh, I don't mean to cut you, because no. as you said that, I have a friend who's a real estate agent and mm -hmm. she was even um, uh, giving me a story where she would have gone to, uh, to view a property for listing mm -hmm. and this person brought an ID and she found it strange and just bought a deed. And when she was looking mm -hmm. at the deed, she realized something is off. Mm -hmm. The ID doesn't correspond with, with the person on, 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 the, on the document. And then um, she did her verification checks and she realized it was fraudulent. It was fraudulent. Yeah. <laughs> and these are the things that the FIU encourages you to look mm -hmm. out for, right? Also look out if it's a cash transaction. You have situations where a person might be like, nah, don't worry, the title good, don't do a search, or they're really pushing, they want a quick sale. And they say, I'm giving you cash for it now. Those are red flags that you need to look out for, right? Now, to go specifically into the lookouts, as I was telling you about the attorneys or the vendors and the signatures. Now, they, they're, you're looking at the discrepancies in the signatures or the name of the attorney. Double check to see if the attorney is deceased. Sometimes people, you say, and it's like, but this attorney died a couple of years ago, but how come they now have a deed here with their name on it? And now you can look at the Law Association's website. Um, exactly. Uh, to verify who's an attorney or who's probably listed. Yeah, um, and a lot of people don't know. It's a, it's a public document. The attorneys, every year, they're published on the, on, the, on the, sorry, the Law Association website, and it's gazetted. And all these things you can access online, you just literally need to Google it, and you will find it. And a lot of times now you get attorney's name, you get the office number. So even you or your attorney could be like, I have a deed here. And you could call an attorney just as the camaraderie and say, I have a deed here. Was this you? Because you probably find or you maybe know the attorney and you realize something looks off in it. Yes. All right. Um, also, check to see if your attorney is registered with FIU. So attorneys, uh, especially those dealing with land transactions, conveyances, are required to be registered with the FIU. And they would have gotten a letter from the FIU with their registration number. And more, in more recent times, they would have gotten a certificate with their registration number. So you ask your attorney as well, are you registered with the FIU? That is you doing your checks as well on them. Indeed. All right? Um, another thing you can look out for, the, remember I said the deed has stamp duty has to be paid. So make sure the deed has been stamped. Make sure it's not just saying, oh, it's assessed. It has to actually bear the stamp on it and seeing how much stamp duty was paid. And, and, let's, and let's touch on that assessment, um, mm -hmm. that, that basically uh, mm -hmm. uh, criteria in terms of having to assess and mm -hmm. then stamp. Um, what, how, how does that assessment work? So essentially, you'd have your deed executed. So it's signed, it's witnessed, it's commissioned. You send it into Board of Inland Revenue for assessment. You will need a valuation done on that property because they need to see what it is it being sold for and what the land is valued at. You submit anything if you have town country approval, your WASA clearance certificates, something else for Board of Inland Revenue numbers, depending who your transaction is with, um, forms of IDs for the persons. Any document goes in for them and then they assess what the stamp duty is. Now, you can also calculate, there's a stamp duty calculator online. Same thing, you literally have to Google it and you could check it. They have it for residential purposes, land transactions, first time homeowners, various categories. And you can put in what this value is and you can check and it gives you an estimate of what the stamp duty will be. And I, sometimes I double check it. And a lot of times it's, it's the same figure that I would get back from a stamp duty when I send in the document for assessment. And once that is assessed, then you then you, you submit the originals and they will they will stamp it and give it to you. So, and after it's stamped. Yeah. So, so therefore the, 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 the certified copy Mm -hmm. Right, would obviously have the stamp, yes, um, and that from Register General, and, and that is certify that it is actually that stamp duty was paid on it, which is a tax was paid on the land, and then you can register the deed, right? Because you can't now remember, I said a registered deed will have a deed number, same thing with a memorandum, it will be a volume and folio number, and it will have registered stamps on it. Now, we have instances where um, individuals would have purchase property, mm -hmm. the, um, the conveyance was done, it's registered. And somehow later on you realize that it's a duplicate deed mm -hmm. or that the root of title is not accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and we have also seen where persons, com um, um, commentators have read just recently where they were stating that, um, I think it was a civil matter, um, where the, the, the aggrieved person was saying that mm -hmm. the attorneys did not do their due diligence mm -hmm. or rather stamp duty or rather, sorry, register general right. was supposed to check a deed to make sure mm -hmm. that it is valid before registering. So this is the thing. That is not the duty of the register general. Remember, they have gotten a document here. It's already been stamped. It's already passed through attorneys. They are not going to do searches to see if it is there's a duplicate. That is where the importance of your title search comes in and your search clerk. 
Now you need to make sure you get a good search clerk to do a thorough search on the land. Because you said you would find instances where someone would have a fraudulent deed here and they will then, maybe the deed gets struck out, right? And then they go and they create another one and they may just change a letter in between. So you have a duplicate and that going to show up. This is where proper title searches come into play, whether the search clerk is doing a search online or they go into the registry to go and get the books themselves. Because sometimes they'll tell us, I gotta go and get the country books after look. And they're looking through everything. You also have to have them check the um, judgments and orders. So you can remember you have you could register judgments against a land. You have this pendants. So you have to check all of these things. And it's a judgment against an individual in case um, some action that would yep. have, um, they would have been the defendant for and judgment will have judgment, been granted. Yeah, or if a land if it's a land is tied up in an action, people could go and file the file caveats, they file this pendants, they tie up the land because they know there are issues with it. Right? And these are things that will come up in your title search report. So these are all the due diligence you do before you reach the point of your signing a sale agreement, your signing your conveyance or whatever it may be, whichever transfer document you're using, before it's stamped, before it reaches the Registrar General. Now, of course, things slip through the cracks, but that's why they, you find people try to educate attorneys and the public more now. These are the red flags to look out for. Leslie, let's take a pin. Um, we have to take a break. You're watching Strictly Legal. We'll be right back. Sound the horns! After Family Saturday, the sky ignites with Blue Sunday. Where Juve meets Spam meets Soka. Juve meets Spam meets Soka. Look how the sun now raising up, and the crowd now waking up. The atmosphere has vibes, and nothing can break it up. A Juve experience featuring Hadco's Phase 2 Pan Groove. Mixed master DJs and powerful Soka. Witness the expression of a newfound freedom with paint and vibes. Vibes, 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 vibes. Dance along to the music of our national instrument. Blue Sunday, a colorful experience, a tradition you won't want to miss. Sunday, May 29th, Festival Grounds, Blanche Shows. North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival 2022 comes alive. Three days, three events, three experiences. Born here, played here. Sound the horn! Get your tickets now at Crosby St. James, Extra Foods Arima, Sangre Grandi, Grand Bazaar, Endeavor and Chaguanas, Digicel Trin City, C3 Mall, and Digicel Head Office, 11 C Marval Road, WESN 38 Gattaca Street, Woodbrook, Suntix.com, or call our ticket hotline at 628 5835 or 681 1516. North Coast Jazz and Heritage Festival is brought to you with the kind support of the Sports and Culture Fund Secretariat, Office of the Prime Minister, the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and the Arts, the Inter American Development Bank, Digicel, Angostura, Amco, Hadco, Blue Waters, Royal Castle, the National Lotteries Control. Board, Gittins and Gittins Real Estate Agents, and WESN. As a mother, convenience is a gift. With so many things to juggle every day, I need ease when doing business. Thanks to iWearSolutions.com, I can order my contact lenses, solutions, and even sunglasses all on the go. Registering and ordering are easy. Plus, I get delivery right at my door or collect in-store if I choose. iWearSolutions.com. Now that's convenience in a click. Visit iWearSolutions.com today and enjoy 15% off your first purchase of contact lenses. And we are back. We are speaking with Ms. Desiree Sanka, attorney at law on avoiding land fraud on strict illegal. So, Desiree, before the break, you were speaking about um, the importance of title yes. searches, particularly um, to show that, they are, that the document or the land is, is um, of proper title. Yes, because essentially you need to make sure that you are getting good title. Just to put it plainly, you are getting good title. And that's where the importance of your searches come in because the searches show the history of the land and it shows the connection between each owner. So when you purchase it, when it was sold to someone, it shows those connections. So you need to make sure a detailed report is done as well as, to, as I said, check for any judgment, so there's pendants registered against the land, all right? Um, a few things they could also just look out for, the description of the property. 
essentially, sometimes you may find in the deed or just the description, there's a schedule. And the yes. schedule describes the property. And you may say, well, it's lot um, 15, for example. But then when you look at the plans, you look at the previous deeds, it's like, but they're saying lot 12. And then you check, it's like, but they do have that many lots. Like there's either it's an, a mistake, it could just be a simple error, or it could be that someone is using a fraudulent document. Or they're just making up lot numbers and they have no lots at all. Lot, right. You know? Um, so those are little things to look out for the properties and whether the person has authority to sell the land. Someone might come and say, well, um, my father died and I have the land here so I can sell it. But then you have to ask the relevant question, did this person really die? Yes, first so, thing. First thing, you know, you check, you see if you get a death certificate. Ask them to provide you with a copy of the death certificate. You could also do a search at probate registry because like, okay, the father died, but do you have the grant? And then they could give you a little run around story. Do your search. And, that, and that's important because mm -hmm. um, there are many times when persons think as though their relative die, they automatically they, become owner of the property, which is not so. That is exactly. And it's like, that's not how it works. Get an attorney, do a probate search, and the probate search will tell you whether an application was made, whether there was a will, whether a grant was issued, when it was issued, and who it was issued to. So if you know the person that's coming to you saying, I can sell this land, it's not the person stated there, and they don't have that grant, because probate will also give you a copy of it. And it's like, I, you don't have authority to sell. Also look at persons who may be, as I said, the beneficiary or the applicant, because they could be applying, but they don't have the grant as yet. Until you have that grant, you cannot sell the land, and a beneficiary cannot sell it to you either, unless they are also the one that's stated as the administrator, or the executor on that grant, whether it be a grant of probate or grant of letters of administration. Of course, that grant is the document that is that is issued from the, the, the probate, probate registry. registry yes, um, that would verify the, the number, the will number, if it's if the if once it's, yeah, because they're entitled to register it at the legal affairs, and once that's done, you will get a will number for it, and that is the will number you put on the deed of assent that you're doing subsequently to transfer the land now to you. Yes. Yes. Um, now, in, in terms of the, the course of action um, when dealing with persons who have committed um, fraud, mm -hmm. um, just walk us through in terms of the criminal process. We have seen where um, even in agricultural or government um, mm -hmm. lands, we've seen a lot mm -hmm. of um, uh, media reports where persons were arrested for, for receiving lands in for, under false pretenses or receiving monies for the purchase of lands under false pretenses, etc. So if it is you think that a transaction is fraudulent or you ended up in a situation where you think someone has defrauded you of the land, you can, like any other offense, go and report it to the police. Whether it is you pick up the phone and call them, you email them, or you go in, preferably you go in, and you email and you, give, you actually give a report, that is the first cause of action. And make sure you get a receipt from them to show that you reported this. And of course, then the police will do their own due diligence and do the investigations. And if, of course, they've gathered the evidence during the interviews and they think it's sufficient, you know, they will then lay a charge. And of course, you will have to be there as a witness when the matter goes through the magistrate court. All right? no. But you also have your civil remedies, which is why I kind of said, make sure you get your receipt <laughs> yes. from the police if you report it. Because your civil remedies now is like, if someone has defrauded you of your land, you want to get it back. You, someone said, well, I was this person. You're like, I was never that person. I never sold the land. You need to, you, money never passed to you. Money passed to somebody else and you don't know who this person is. You cannot find this person. You have remedies in the civil jurisdiction. So your receipt would show obviously that you reported it to the police first, but the remedies you have, you could get an injunction against it or against the person for the time where the transaction took place or how it took place. You get, you seek a declaration from the court. That's something as you asked for because you need the judge to say, that the deed be struck off the struck off the registry. This is a fraudulent deed, it needs to be struck off. Because then when you do searches, it's gonna show up. Yes. And you don't want the deed showing up. Even if it does, you still need to, that's why I said check to see if there are any judgments registered. Because that will show like, okay, a judgment is registered. This is supposed to be struck out. How is this showing up in the search? Right? And sometimes people will get a deed struck off and then go and make a next one. Yes. And then try to use that. <coughs> and that's how they will be selling land two and three and four times to multiple people. And then people turn up on the land and say, well, I have title. And it's like, no, but I have title. But then you have instances where, where the um, persons or, or the landowner sometimes uh, investigated for lands that is purportedly, mm -hmm. um, that they purported to have been sold mm -hmm. when they did not. And then you would see in a case where there's a signature of that individual and they have, and they, I mean, they never sold the land. Exactly, and then a lot of times they say, it's like, I didn't sell this, this is not my ID, or they will say, this is not my signature, and then when they, pro they provide it, you're like, this is why your checks come in, 
people say, well, to go and search Elections and Boundaries website, who going to go through all of that hassle? But it's that extra due diligence that helps. Now, persons will blame attorneys and say, well, attorneys didn't do their checks. So attorneys, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, well, of course, didn't go to, the, to, to do their searches. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes clients are like, well, I don't want to do any search. You know, just sell it as mm -hmm. it is. Or just, I, I, I prefer to um, actually not sell the buyer because it's yeah. the buyer's duty to do their search. Yep. Uh, now, uh, on a number of these, there's what you call an exoneration clause. Yes. Um, <laughs> that attorneys use in terms of exonerating them from any liabilities. liabilities if um, down the road, there's a fraudulent um, mm -hmm. activities. Or, Especially or if the person didn't want to do a title. Correct. So. Now, how, how, um, how strong is, is, is that exoneration clause? Are attorneys really exempted or exonerated from liability? So, like anything, you need there's a certain level of risk. You need to make sure you have your instructions in writing and that everything was actually clearly advised to your clients. You need to give very clear advice. And I said, why it is you need to do these searches? All right? Stress the importance of it. And if they really can't, because sometimes people say, I don't have the money. And you could, you could negotiate with your, with your attorney and say, all right, well, this is how much it's going to be, but we need to do it. But then there's also protection of attorney, which is your professional indemnity insurance. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> and that is something that, that many attorneys don't necessarily have mm -hmm. or, or, they, or they think as though they don't need. Yeah. So um, there's always, a, and that, there's always a certain level of risk, which is why we say attorneys who need to do their due diligence, right? But if you think there was a suspicious transaction that occurred, Remember, they, the clients can report it to the police. The attorney can also report it. Huh? Um, they can do what we call it something with the FIU, yes. a suspicious activity report or STR, suspicious transaction report, and that's completely anonymous. Now, we've been hearing about in media land grab, land grab, land grab. People are land grabbing state, state um, yeah. property. Um, tell us, is, is that a thing in terms of, okay, how, how can someone just acquire state property just like that? I mean, as we say, squatting. Mm. <laughs> So you have what we call most an adverse possession, right? Now, if it's state land, it's 30 years. Just know that. It's yes. 30 years. So anything else is used is 16 years. So things that persons can do if it's an individual to protect yourself is, look, make sure if you're letting somebody occupy a land. Because sometimes people will be like, well, I'm not coming to the land often. A neighbor has to plant in it. You let them plant. You don't get nothing in writing. You don't charge them any rent. And then, you know, you, they're just not seeing you anymore. And then it's like, okay, time passed, and they come and say, well, I have rights to this. And it's like, but you don't have rights. But then where does the evidence come? So you need to look out to these things. Make sure you want to check in on your land. Cut your grass. Let your neighbors get to know you. Yes. Fence off your property, right? With the state land under 30 years, a lot of times persons, some, yes, you have the squatters that are over 30 years, but then some of them actually have what we call the certificate of comfort, right? So they would have been there for a certain period of time under Land Settlement Agency or LSA, they would have gotten a certificate of comfort. The problem with that, or the risk, I should say, not necessarily a problem, is sometimes persons think that once I have a certificate of comfort, I have title to that land. Yes. But you don't. It is still the state land. What you have is an interest on the land, an interest to occupy it, right? That's all it is. When we say interest, a right to occupy it. That's what you have, right? And they can move you at any point and then put you somewhere else. So you have no interest in land. And, but you would find persons who would be trying to sell land under, and be like, well, I have a certificate of comfort, and they would try to sell the land. Now, you can get title. That's not to say you can't. But it it's takes a while. It takes a while. It is a process you have to go through with LSA to apply for it, the different types of deeds that you would get. The first, the first um, lease will give you 30 years, and then eventually you get what we call the statutory lease, which could give you up to 199 years. Yes. Right? But it... It takes a long time. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but a lot of people don't want to go through the hassle of saying, well, I have a certificate of comfort. I'm good with using that. I don't want to get, I don't want a deed. I don't want a deed at least. I still valid, and that way you could end up in, in, um, in trouble mm -hmm. and before the courts um, yep. due to, to selling state land that you don't have title to. Yep. Right? So that's important. So, so as, we, as we wrap up, just tell us what advice you would give to persons just to prevent um, being that victim. I would tell them, just do your due diligence. Ask the questions from who is the potential vendor. Ask the questions of your attorney. Stress the importance of the title search report. Right? Do proper searches. Let your attorney review the documents and advise you on it. If you're not sure, ask the questions. And as I said, go and check in on your land sometimes. A lot of people have land in remote areas. They're always going up there. The neighbors don't necessarily know them. Just go and let your neighbors start to know you, fence around your property, 
and just do your due diligence and you'll be fine. I think um, encroachment and trespass is the topic for another day. That um, to speak with persons who automatically just start to move their fence posts because they don't see you. A little bit, a little bit of right? time. Because yes. as you said, they don't see you and make sure and check on mm -hmm. your land because just so your land will just be gone. Exactly, and people <laughs> come and say adverse possession. Yes, and, and you've lost your, years. And you've lost title to your own land. Uh, so that's we really thank you so much. We are out of time, but thank you so much for gracing us on Strictly Legal. Thank you very much for having me. It really was a pleasure. Indeed. Do have a great day. Guys, it's a wrap. You have been watching Strictly Legal on WASN Content Capital. I am your host, Rondell Donoa. You can stream us on WASN and our podcast, Strictly Legal with Rondell Donoa. Before I leave, I'll leave you with a quote. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Good day.